Magister, é, intitulada Detenção dos Imigrantes Deportados na França, Detenção tensão entre controle de direitos fundamentais, não está ligado não? Pronto, agora está funcionando. Ok, então vamos dar início à conferência do professor Nicolas Pacher, é intitulada Detenção dos Imigrantes Deportados na França, tensão entre controle de direitos fundamentais, é, Nicolas Pacher é do Sergipe, da Universidade de Versailles, no Cantão de Clínico, do CNRS. Ele está entre nós a partir de um acordo Carlos Cofecu, do qual ele faz parte, de que o professor René Levy, que já esteve aqui fazendo a conferência dele, é o coordenador francês e eu sou a coordenadora brasileira. Está aqui presente também o professor Michel Luiz, que é também um dos integrantes. Eu agradeço, de última oportunidade, Lá, ele vai falar em inglês? Sim. É, ele vai falar lentamente, né, para que vocês possam acompanhar. E obrigada mais uma vez. Muito obrigado. Ah, quero agradecer a Joana pela sua invitação. E está na ocasião de apresentar parte do meu trabalho. E desculpe, porque não vou, não vou falar em português, e português é bastante limitado, de maneira que eu vou a, a falar em inglês, mas lentamente. So, um, yes, I will speak slowly and I will address today a topic that is, well, as you probably know, much debated now in France and everywhere in Europe, the uh, control of immigration, but I'm going to uh, address it through a specific institution which I studied in my past uh, research. Institutions of detention that we call in France Centre de Rétention Administrative. You could translate it in English by immigration detention, but actually in English you don't have this uh, nuance that exists in French that also exists in Portuguese between retenção and detenção. Uh, detenção, detenção is basically penal. It's about penal detention in prisons. What I am talking about is not penal, it's administrative rétention. And this is actually pretty important to understand what I'm going to talk about because Precisely, those centres de rétention, detention centres, are places that are run by the police and they have no penal objective. So they don't follow a judicial decision. People who are locked up in those places have not been condemned by a tribunal. And those places are only designed to detain foreigners, immigrants, who are being deported from France, mostly because they don't have a residence permit and who should then be detained only for the time necessary to the preparation of their removal. So it's really about the police watch, the police surveillance of people who are not criminal offenders. Now, why is this interesting? Uh, why was it interesting for my research? It's because as non-penal and non-judicial detention places, those centers have been much criticized in the past decades in France. And they've been criticized in the name of the rule of law, l'état de droit in French, and the idea of uh, protection of fundamental rights. The general idea is that the police detention of people who have not been convicted for anything is something problematic in a state that's supposed to be democratic and that is supposed to be following the principles of the rule of law. So, for me, working on those detention places was a way to work on this general tension between repression of irregular or illegal immigration and the protection of fundamental rights, which is a tension that you can find 
in general, I think, in most uh, immigration policies in France and in Europe, you have that kind of uh, problematic in many institutions. So, uh, actually, what is interesting, what is even more interesting for immigration detention in France, is that as a result of that critique, there were many um, movements, campaigns from human rights organizations against the detention of immigrants, but that social critique, that political critique of detention, of immigration detention, was included to the very institution when it was officialized in the late 1970s, early 1980s. In other words, when immigration uh, detention centers were officialized, there was this demand, this imperative for some kind of control over what the police was doing in those places. And there were two types of controls that were added to immigration detention. The first one was judicial, so there was control by judges, by courts, what you could call judicial review. And as early as 1984, there was a control from human rights organizations. So in 1984, a human right, one single human rights organization at that time was allowed to enter detention centers. So you had teams of lawyers from this organization in every detention center, and it is still the case today, although the organization is a bit different, but I will go back to this. So the critique, the very critique of detention centers has been included somewhat in the organization of those centers. The critique actually provoked, in part, the initial officialization, uh, officialization sorry, of the uh, detention centers, and then was really included to the everyday enforcement. So, for me, this was a way, first of all, of course, I mean, working on those detention centers was a way, of course, to work on places of detention, their history, their enforcement nowadays, but it was also a way to work about the status of social critique facing this kind of policy. In other words, what happens to the critique of the independent critique of human rights organizations and so forth when these organizations collaborate with the authorities and accept to be part as critical organizations, as critical actors, but accept to be part of the deportation process and of the enforcement of detention. So what happens to the critique and how is it uh, materially organized? And as I said before, this is a phenomenon that you find in France in immigration detention, but it's a phenomenon that you would find in many European countries. And this is why I gave this uh, reference of uh, the work of Antje Ellermann, who is, I think, a German uh, scholar, who's written this book uh, called States Against Migrants, Deportation in Germany and the United States, where she makes a comparison between these two countries, uh, a comparison of the deportation process and immigration detention, but also a comparison of the way human rights organizations intervene in the whole process of deportations and intervene, of course, critically, but also as part of the process itself, uh, being you know, present in certain administrations, certain places of detention, and so on. So you find that same kind of tension in a, a series of countries. So, to uh, elaborate on this, uh, this situation, I will proceed in two times. I will first analyze three uh, I mean, the general debates over the creation and the reform of immigration detention centers in France. So I will advise three different debates, three different uh, critical episodes from the 1970s uh, until the, uh, the years 2000, where the status of immigration detention and the status of the critique inside immigration detention has been debated. 
And then I will turn to the results of uh, a research I, I performed in one of those centers some years ago following a team of one of these human rights organizations and I will give a more ethnographical insight of uh, the way this, uh, this critical logic is organized. So, before uh, turning to this, uh, these aspects, let me just uh, give you a general idea of the context of immigration control, not only in France, but also in Europe. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the European Union is going through an immigration crisis as we speak, with about 340,000 refugees uh, who have tried to enter the European territory uh, since the beginning of this year. On the map I'm showing here, the uh, European Union is presented in pink, and uh, you furthermore have what is uh, represented by this blue line uh, that you have here. These limits here are the limits of the Schengen area, uh, which is an area of uh, stronger control at the exterior of this line, uh, this line here. So inside the line, for the member states of the Schengen area, border controls have been minimalized. They are minimal, at least for European citizens. But outside this line, you have stronger controls for citizens of uh, states that are not members of the Schengen area and the European Union who are being uh, much more controlled. And finally, those little spots you have all over Europe are administrative detention places. So as you can see, France is not the only case, uh, the only uh, country where you have the multiplication of those detention places that are run by the police and not by the penitentiary administration. You have these uh, basically all over Europe. So, uh, what I just wanted to emphasize, uh, referring to this map, is the contrast that you have today between what's going on on the external borders of the Schengen area, so all around here, and especially in the south here, and what's happening inside the Schengen area. On the other side, the main policy of the European Union has been to ask to its, uh, especially its southern neighbors, uh, especially Morocco and, well, Libya and Egypt are uh, pretty specific cases, but especially Morocco, uh, the request from the European Union has been to, uh, for these countries to try to stop the immigrants on their own territory before the immigrants enter the European Union. So in a way, the border is going south, and it's going more and more to the south. As the European Union is negotiating treaties with Morocco, with Mauritania, with Mali, and so on. And this policy has been also a way for European countries to escape the controls that exist, the democratic controls that exist inside the European Union, but that, of course, are much less uh, important outside the European Union, whether Morocco or Mauritania. So, the situation inside the European Union is that, well, you have a lot of uh, control, repression, violence, but you do have judicial control and control from the civil society, from uh, human rights organizations, that is much stronger, of course, than outside the European Union. And the situation I was referring to on immigration detention centers in France is a good example of that kind of logic of repression and control of repression. So, uh, now to uh, give you a few insights of the history of the institutionalization of immigration detention, you can uh, basically make up three different phases in the, uh, this institutionalization and those reforms of immigration detention. The first period 
and probably one of the most interesting ones, is between 1975 and 1984. So, uh, if I start in 1975, the detention of immigrants who are being deported from France is actually, already exists, but it is mostly uh, an informal police practice. So there is a, you could call it an old tradition of the French police, of arresting immigrants, detaining them for some time, sometimes releasing them uh, uh, in some part of the city, sometimes keeping them in police custody in a variety of different places uh, until they are being deported and so forth. But this is not, uh, it's not defined by any kind of legal provision, any kind of text, and it is not controlled uh, by the judicial power or any kind of hierarchy. It's a mainly informal police practice. So what happens in 1975? First of all, we are in a period of pretty intense critique of all detention institutions in France. Uh, prisons are being much attacked and, and criticized by human rights organizations. Psychiatric hospitals, for example, are also being criticized. Uh, police custody, police practices as well. And so as a result, there is a pretty important attention and critical attention as to what's happening to uh, people who are being detained, immigrants, uh, delinquents, and so forth. And in this context, in 1975, the place of detention that was actually a, an old warehouse in the port of Marseille, in the south of France, is discovered by uh, a set of militants, uh, advocates from, a, from various human rights organizations, uh, they discover that the police has been locking up people, locking up immigrants in bad places without any notice, without uh, you know, advising anyone. And as a result, there is a pretty intense, pretty strong campaign against that uh, practice of detention. That campaign becomes national, uh, it goes to court, there is a, a judicial campaign as well in order to ban that practice of detaining immigrants. So it's a very uh, important public, uh, public denunciation. And the paradoxical result of uh, this, uh, this campaign was in 1980 uh, the officialization of the practice. But this officialization of the practice came along a series of controls over detention. So, immigration detention centers, Centre de Détention Administrative, became official institutions at the time when deportations uh, of, of immigrants were starting again at a very high, uh, very high scale, very high level. But at the same time, this, first of all, a judicial control was added, and finally, in 1984, one human rights organization was allowed to send advocates militants inside uh, the detention centers. So, finally, in 1984, the tension uh, between repression uh, yeah, and the uh, control, the supervision over the respect of fundamental rights was included uh, inside detention centers. Uh, a little bit quicker on the two other uh, critical periods. In 2000, there was a new attempt, uh, first attempt from uh, the Ministry of the Interior in France to try to drive the human rights organization that had been here since 1984 out of immigration detention centers. So there was a second uh, critical period with a very strong campaign from various organizations for these advocates to remain inside detention centers, and the result was actually that these advocates were allowed to stay inside detention centers. Their position actually even got stronger, and uh, the years 2000 and 2001 were years when they started publishing every year a report, like a survey, on the situation of all detention centers. So they gained some power uh, in front of uh, the state 
state institutions. And the other result of this uh, public, uh, public crisis was the definition of a real judicial uh, legal status for immigration detention centers, including the definition of special rights for those detained people, detained immigrants, called retenus, retidos, who thus could enjoy different rights and broader rights than people who are being penally detained in prisons. So there was a real uh, inscription in, in the law of this difference between prisons and detention centers for immigrants. And finally, in 2008, 2010, there was one last attack against the presence of human rights, uh, human rights activists inside detention centers, which was somewhat, more, somewhat uh, more subtle, because actually, this time, the Ministry of Immigration at that time uh, attacked the presence of human rights organizations uh, by trying to multiply the number of human rights organizations present inside detention centers. So the idea was uh, definitely to try to divide and oppose uh, a number of different uh, human rights organizations by having not only one but four or five different organizations inside detention centers trying to create some kind of competition between those organizations. But the official uh, uh, justification for this was to make detention centers more transparent. And the main argument was the more organizations we have inside, the more transparent it's going to be because we're going to have different looks, uh, different outlooks and framings of the uh, situation in detention centers. And so, finally, this was a success point for the Ministry of Immigration, and there are now five different organizations in uh, five different regions uh, of France for immigration detention. But they actually learn to collaborate with each other, and so the, the uh, activist dimension is still uh, quite active. So, uh, this was, again, a very uh, quick and very fast outlook. Having uh, given an idea of this general context, I'm going to uh, draw on the field work I performed in one of those detention centers to give you a more precise insight of the way this cohabitation between police repression, critique, uh, also medical and social relief for, uh, for immigrants is organized in a detention center. So, I'm going to go on the uh, field work I performed in uh, one of the biggest detention centers in France, which is located in the, um, uh, right next to the runways of the main airport of Paris in Roissy Charles de Gaulle. Uh, at the time when I performed this field work, it was, and it actually still is one of the biggest ones, uh, it could uh, receive up to 140 detainees, both men and women, but I'll go back to that. And it was run at that time uh, not by the civil police or the police nationale, but by the gendarmerie, uh, which you cannot really compare to the policia militar in, in Brazil because it's very different, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it is part of the French military and it's a uh, department of the French military that's performing uh, police work. So it was run by the gendarmerie, which I will probably call the police uh, from time to time in this presentation. And it also included a series of teams, uh, first of uh, civil, uh, civilians who were running the uh, general management, management sorry, of the uh, detention center, so everything that Concern the, uh, the beds, uh, the laundry, and so on. You also have a team. You also have, sorry, a team of uh, social workers, all civil servants, a team of medical practitioners, uh, many nurses from the nearby hospital, and finally you have a team of five advocates from a human rights organization who intervene inside the detention center by teams of two every day. 
And so, as you can probably see here, uh, you had two different zones inside the detention center. The first zone was the so-called police zone, zone, or gendarmerie zone. It's the one you have here, and this is where you have the buildings, uh, the, uh, the, the police buildings, and especially this building here. Okay, this, these were the main headquarters of the gendarmerie, the police. This is where all the uh, detention files and deportation files were being run and followed by police officers. So this is why, where all the uh, organization of deportation, of the boarding of uh, deported immigrants on a, on a flight in the airport was followed and being organized. This is also the uh, building all the immigrants who were received at first in the detention center had to go through in order to be literally turned into retenu, into detained uh, people. So on one side, the immigrants uh, would enter, they would go through a corridor with their detention file, they would be searched, uh, they would be uh, told as well, informed about their rights inside the detention centers, and so finally, at the other side of the corridor, they would be handed their identification card for the, uh, for the, the duration of their stay inside the center and they could go into the second zone that you have here that was called, that was called the detention zone this is where you had the uh, buildings uh, for the housing, with the bedrooms for the detainees and also, oops, sorry and also the main building where all the non-police actors were located. So the uh, medical practitioners, the human rights organizations, all the offices of the non-police uh, services inside the centers were located as well in this zone. Now what's interesting about this zoning, this geographic zoning and spatial organization of the center is that there was much, uh, they have pretty strong appropriation of those zones by the actors who worked inside them. Especially inside the detention zone, uh, this was a zone where in ordinary times, uh, apart from uh, situations of crisis, riots and so on, the police was not really present. So police officers would uh, basically make tours and, and you know, uh, basic surveillance around the zone without entering it. You also had uh, CCTV cameras, as you can see in this picture here, uh, all over the uh, detention zone. But in ordinary times, no policeman was present inside that zone. So there was an idea for the non-police uh, services, human rights organization, uh, activists, and medical practitioners, social workers, that this was actually there. So, the zone where immigrants were being provided with relief, social relief, medical care, the zone where immigrants could find something else than police repression and control and all the fear and anxiety that was associated with, uh, with police control. And this is actually pretty interesting uh, to understand what I'm going to uh, describe now. So, how did it work in ordinary times. In ordinary times, you had, as in most institutions, a series of routines to organize the collective work of all those different actors. And you had some kind of implicit, some kind of tacit agreement between police members and non-police actors on the right way to manage the center the right way to manage the uh, detained population. Most of those uh, members, when I, when I did my field work, had been working there for years and years, and they knew each other pretty well. And what's interesting, as we will see later, uh, what was interesting about this agreement, that it was, of course, something that had been slowly interiorized by all members of the staff, something that had been learned as a routine, routinized through the years. But these negotiated orders between all actors of the center was also grounded on things, 
on the very special organization of the detention center and its architecture and, uh, and so forth. But of course, what is interesting in that case is what happens in critical moments where this agreement is actually breached and it has to be explicitly renegotiated between all those actors. So, in the time I have left, I'm going to describe one of those moments, which is actually pretty interesting because it's a moment of crisis, but it's also a moment where you can, where I was able to witness the critical work of human rights advocates inside the centers uh, in, face, in the face of what they consider as a police abuse uh, of the uh, detained population. So what happened? Uh, first of all, there was an evasion out of the center of, uh, at that time, actually, four detainees. All of this happened at night, so I learned about it when I uh, entered the center, when I arrived in the center on the morning. Uh, what was very uh, obvious inside the center was that the police was present everywhere, including in the detention area, in the detention zone, zone where no police officer was, uh, was present in ordinary times. And so what I learned, what uh, everybody learned actually on this morning, was that four immigrants had managed to get out of the center and that the whole thing had been organized by different teams of detainees. So what those detainees did was that one team set fire, started a fire on one of the buildings of uh, the detention center, so one of the, those buildings you see here on the, uh, on the picture, to create a diversion, and while everybody was uh, working on the, on the fire, trying to put the fire out, another team uh, destroyed part of the fence of the detention center and got out. So, the answer of uh, the police team, of the gendarmerie, was to enter the detention zone and to, to confiscate, to remove from the detainees every lighter that the detainees had, because the lighters had been used to start the fire, and uh, their second decision was to remove all the cellular phones of the uh, detainees. The detainees, precisely because they, are, because they are not prisoners, they are not penal detainees, are able to remain with their cellular phones uh, inside the detention centers. So all of those phones were confiscated by the police in the morning. And this is when it started to be interesting, because the response of the uh, human rights organization team was to immediately go to the office of the head of the center, of the police officer who was uh, chief of the center, to protest and to explicitly say that cellular phones were about the freedom of uh, communication inside the center that the detainees had a right to communicate with the exterior because precisely the detention center was not a place of penal detention, it was not a prison. So all of this was explicitly stated in the office and the demand of the activists was that the cellular phones be uh, given back to the detainees, which actually happened uh, at the end of the day. This was the first phase. The second phase, uh, a few hours later, was when uh, a group, a small group of immigrants came to see those same advocates from the human rights organization saying that one of the vending machines that uh, distributed uh, phone cards inside the uh, detention center had been employed. So, uh, if you're familiar with this, uh, inside the detention center you had phone booths, telephone booths, and you could use them with phone cards that you could buy from a, from a machine, from a vending machine. So, what the immigrants reported was that this machine had been employed supposedly by police officers. So, this time the answer of uh, the uh, team of advocates, the two, the two advocates from the human rights organization who were there, was to inquire on this. So they literally turned the detention center into a place of inquiry 
uh, starting to ask questions, to uh, move around in the detention center, to try to make out whether the police was uh, indeed responsible for this action. And there was a second complaint, but there was actually a report that was written by those advocates and sent to the hierarchy uh, at the uh, national siege of the organization. So, what is interesting in that case? This is, of course, a case where everything worked very well for the, uh, the, these people from the human rights organization. Because, precisely, they could use material landmarks to ground their critical judgment. Uh, simple objects, like cellular phones or vending machines, enabled them to spot first uh, a deviance from the police, something that was out of place, literally, in the detention center. And then, to turn this police deviance into some kind of violation or infringement of fundamental rights, and to literally refer this to uh, a legal text. So this is a pretty interesting way to see how uh, Judgment, ordinary judgments, but also legal judgments, can be grounded in the very organization, material organization of the place. And this is why I gave this uh, small reference of uh, an article by Laurent Tegno, uh, an article in French actually, uh, which I used a lot on this, on this research, which gives you an insight on the ethnography of the production of critical judgments uh, in a certain place. But of course, again, this is an example of a critical uh, activity inside the detention centers that worked very well because those uh, landmarks were available inside the detention centers. Of course, there is a series of situations where you actually don't have that kind of, uh, these kind of landmarks. So I'll just briefly, uh, briefly give a few examples of these because they are uh, pretty representative yet, uh, I think, for what happens in a lot of uh, detention centers. First example, what happened, what happens at night in detention centers. Because all those non-police actors, whether it be uh, human rights organization activists and advocates or uh, medical personnel, uh, social workers, and so on. All these people are only present during the day, in daytime. At night time, you go back to a simple relation between police officers and immigrants. And what happens in those moments has no other witness than these two groups of actors. And while I was doing my field work, there were numerous, countless cases of uh, complaints that happened in the morning of immigrants who complained about insults, about, uh, in certain cases, violence from police officers that had reportedly happened during the night, but that were impossible to prove on the other side, because what you were facing that, uh, in that case was just the word of police officers against the word of immigrants. So in that case, no or very few landmarks were available for any kind of inquiry. So this was the first uh, first case, but again there were countless cases like that. The second situation is, uh, I think, even more interesting. It doesn't uh, directly concern police activity, but it does have a lot to do with the policy of the uh, immigration detention centers. Throughout the field work that I performed in this uh, detention center, there were rumors of prostitution inside the center. Uh, precisely because there were women, both men and women, inside the center. But those rumors of prostitution were basically impossible to prove in the same way. Uh, human rights activists were uh, constantly reporting saying that there was prostitution, the medical staff was saying the same thing. The immigrants themselves uh, admitted that there was prostitution. Some of them even came to, uh, to, 
to get money inside their, uh, their luggage, the luggage they had left when entering the center in order to pay, uh, as they uh, admitted themselves, for, uh, for prostitutes and so on. But the police systematically denied this possible existence of uh, prostitution. Now, one of the problems about this was that the center did include men and women, but it had been designed and built only for men. The uh, female population had been uh, uh, accepted inside the uh, detention center, I think, in 2003, but in emergency, because all the other centers, detention centers of the region, were completely full and could not receive anyone. So what happened was that a building, but a provisional building was added inside the center and the women were basically put there. At night, they were locked up. Everybody was locked up inside the, uh, the buildings. So there could be no, uh, no kind of exchange or uh, contact, contact between men and women. But in daytime, there was free circulation inside the detention zone for both men and women. So men and women could possibly manage to go inside a, a bedroom and uh, things could, could happen with no actual surveillance and no organization, no material organization for any kind of surveillance to happen, to be performed inside the detention center. So this was a contrary example of a situation where the critical outlook on detention could not actually be grounded on anything. And again, throughout the uh, field work they performed. There were those rumors of prostitution happening and no way to actually make police officers actually believe that something was indeed happening and act about it. So, uh, I will uh, finish with this example just with uh, maybe a small conclusion on uh, I think what's really interesting with this uh, situation of critical organizations that accepted in the years, in the decades, um, 1980s, 1990s, increasingly, to cooperate and to work with state institutions. You have this example for immigration detention. You could uh, give other examples of other human rights organizations that accepted to work with the other administrations, uh, for example, uh, on operations of legalizations of irregular immigrants and so forth. You have the same kind of situation uh, in the case of prisons in France, but it's less about advocacy and defense of human rights, it's more about social relief and, uh, and that kind of organization. And then you also have another phenomenon of public institutions, public agencies, who are created in the same way to visit detention, detention places and make critical reports and surveys on the situation inside those, uh, those detention places. This is actually uh, the research I'm doing right on one of, those, one of those agencies. So it's pretty interesting to see how since the 1970s, since this very critical period when all detention places basically were put under critical uh, scrutiny by a series of independent human rights organizations, it's pretty interesting to see how this critique has been partly institutionalized and included to state administration, which of course does not mean that there is absolute control, because there is actually a lot of violence happening, whether it be in prisons or in detention centers for, uh, for immigrants. But the critique now is in uh, a closer and closer relation with the state institutions. Obrigado. Obrigado, Nicolás, pela sua exposição. Eu vou abrir para a plateia. Podemos fazer um conjunto de perguntas, Michel? S'il y a prévision constitutionnelle de l'ouverture de ce champ, de cette forme, euh, non seulement pour le gynécologue, 
que é junto com o seu Se há previsão constitucional na França para a abertura desses campos, não apenas para situações de imigração irregular, mas para muitas situações. Uh, well, there is nothing in the Constitution itself about a detention or immigration detention. What is inscribed in the Constitution is the uh, idea that the judicial judge is the guardian of uh, fundamental rights and, and public liberties. So for that reason, uh, there is judicial, this, is the, this was the reason why a judicial control, a judicial review uh, of courts of revision detention was created in the 1980s. And what happened at that time was that uh, we have, uh, <coughs> you can call it a court, though it's not exactly a court or a Supreme Court, uh, it's an institution called the Conseil Constitutionnel, the Constitutional Council, and its mission is to review laws that are being uh, discussed by the Parliament and to control their conformity to the Constitution, with the Constitution. And the Constitutional Council uh, reviewed the, uh, the law that officially created immigration detention in 1979 and uh, the main statement of the Council was that immigration detention was legal, could be, uh, could be actually legalized but that it could not possibly happen without a review from the judicial judge. That you had to be a judicial, you had to have a judicial review over uh, immigration detention after a certain amount of time of detention. So after, uh, at, in the beginning, after 24 hours of detention, you had to have a judicial review of all detention measures. So all detained immigrants had to go before court and the judge was, would examine the legality of their detention. So it was 24 hours, then it became 48 hours, then it became 6 days, and now it's 15 days. So after 15 days of detention, if you have not been deported yet, you go to court and the judge examines the uh, legality of your detention, and if your detention is illegal, you can actually be set free on the, the territory. You still have a deportation order, so you are still deportable, but you can be set free. And you can actually be rearrested and sent back to the detention center. That's one of the contradictions of this tension between repression and the rule of law. The judge doesn't care about what the police does. So the police arrests people, and the judge frees them on the territory and all over again. Aussi, ils travaillent en période de temps. 
do cotidiano desses centros, né? Uma primeira dúvida era como esses centros já são, de certa forma, uma seleção de quem chega na França, né? Então, eles devem passar por outros é, momentos de controle até conseguirem chegar ao centro. Então, os centros já são as poucas pessoas que conseguem chegar nesse centro. E, e as outras questões, na verdade, são um pouco mais sobre o cotidiano. Quem está ali naquele centro, como é a economia desses centros, se as crianças também estão presentes, os filhos dos, das pessoas que estão lá. Uh, so uh, I will answer in English. Uh, thank you for, for those questions. Uh, okay, so about the people who are being detained, uh, if you look at the status, you have a variety of status. Uh, the majority of immigrants who are detained are people who are simply undocumented. They have no residence permit in France. They are arrested uh, in, in kind of public space and, uh, and they are kept in police custody first and then sent to the uh, detention center. Among these people, you do have asylum seekers. Uh, not people who have uh, made a claim for asylum outside, because in that case, they have a provisional residence permit but people who actually want to ask for asylum and they make their asylum claim from the inside of the detention center. This is actually one of the uh, missions of those human rights advocates I, uh, I talked about. They are helping, they are also helping the immigrants to uh, you know, go on with the process of uh, the asylum claim, of some legal, uh, legal claims and Legal, uh, legal attempts they make to try to have their deportation orders removed as well. That's another very interesting uh, part of what they are doing. And uh, yeah, and you also have a uh, yeah, smaller group of people who are being deported after a criminal conviction. So they have been convicted for an offense, they have been sent to prison, and when their penal conviction is over, where their prison time is over, they are being sent to immigration detention. So they remain, they go from one type of detention to another type. So you also have these, uh, these immigrants. And yeah, so basically what happens is that these people, because you, you talked about selection, and it is true that anyway, these people are just one pretty small part of all the people who are undocumented on the French territory. So, uh, there are those who are being arrested, first of all. Among those who are being arrested, some are never sent to detention, never deported, they are just released like that by the police. And another part is put in police custody and then sent to detention centers. And this is why I wanted to show you uh, this table here, where you can make a comparison between the number of deportation orders that are issued every year in France and the number of those deportation orders that are being actually enforced, so people who are actually being sent back to their country of origin. And it's a small minority, a very small number, and the percentage has been quite steady in the past year, so it's 20%, 23%, 29%, uh, in 2012. So, uh, yes, in, the, in immigration detention, you have a small part of those who are arrested, and those who are arrested are only a small part of those who are with no document, who are facing a deportation order. And then you have all those who have never been arrested, have never faced a deportation order, who are simply undocumented on French, uh, French territory. Uh, as for children, there are uh, children in immigration detention in France. It's been authorized uh, in 2005. And, uh, well, minors themselves cannot be deported, but they can be deported if their parents are being deported. And it's the same for detention. They can be detained if their parents are being detained. So uh, there are special requirements for immigration detention centers uh, to receive, in order for them to, uh, to receive uh, children, but it's pretty basic. It's basically about having, uh, you know, 
baby food and uh, stuff like that. But there are children in, uh, in detention centers. And finally, on the economy, that is a very, very interesting uh, topic. You do have, uh, you have markets, you have public markets on, on catering, for example, food, uh, laundry, and so on, in immigration detention. You, have, you also have public markets on the very building of those detention centers. Actually, uh, among the uh, recent denunciation campaigns by uh, human rights organizations, there has been uh, a few uh, denunciation campaigns against um, great uh, French companies of uh, real estate and building who had won markets uh, in order to build detention centers. So uh, people demonstrated on, in front of their, uh, their siege and demanded that they stop all, uh, all type of building. Uh, you have architects who have been contacted as well to design detention centers. Well, that's uh, not detention centers actually, it's, so that is a bit different. But you do have markets. And for the catering, for example, for food, uh, most of the catering inside detention centers now is being uh, provided with by uh, organizations that do catering for companies, uh, society or administration. So they manage, basically manage restaurants and administrations of private companies and they also manage all the catering inside the detention centers. And they've been attacked and complained against as well. But there is, yes, there is an economy. There are no private centers as opposed to what's happened in Australia, for example, or in Canada. All centers are public, but there is a lot of money uh, changing hands in, uh, around that, that type of detention.
the, letting the police deal with these kinds of issues, like uh, immigration. Uh, and I, I read recently an article by Gabriel Fulton from Sao Paulo, and he also mentioned that as one of the examples of, of showing how like, um, about the management of certain populations who are seen as internal immigrants, uh, or <laughs> enemies, <laughs> sorry. Immigrants as internal enemies, and here that would be um, to the population. Yeah, I guess. So, uh, on the position of the uh, French government in the recent crisis, I was looking at the uh, number of uh, migrants who have been accepted. Uh, Germany is the country that so far has accepted the greatest number of uh, asylum seekers in, uh, in this crisis. Behind Hungary, but well, Hungary has been uh, basically mistreating them, but they've been received. Uh, Italy, France, and Sweden. So the French government's position has been to call uh, both for more solidarity, I would say, uh, between European states and to accept uh, a few thousands, like uh, 30 thousands maybe, no, yeah, it's about 30 thousands, right? Uh, th about 30 thousand um, immigrants on its territory which is not the worst we've seen, uh, probably in Europe. Um, so yeah, it's one of the most, uh, probably one of the most active with Germany, but with less uh, hospitality, shall we say, than Germany. Uh, then the situation inside France right now is uh, pretty uh, awkward because we have, we have a left-wing government with a general uh, discourse on the, necessi the necessity to, uh, to accept immigrants and to protect their rights and so on, under pretty strong pressure from the far right, which, uh, well, in, in the past days I said paralyze, uh, probably shouldn't say paralyze because it's not that strong, but that's, that's putting a lot of pressure definitely on what can be said and not said on, uh, on, on immigrants and the welcoming of immigrants uh, in France right now. Uh, as for the, uh, the inter international cooperation, um, there they have, yeah, there have been attempts to uh, create uh, a European framework of human rights organization to uh, try to work you know, continent size, so to speak, uh, for the uh, protection of immigrants. Uh, there is a network that's supposed to be European. It's, it's pretty French, actually, but it does have connection with other countries. That's called Migros Europe. So the name says it all. The idea is to 
put together uh, various organizations of different European countries in order to work together and try to protect the uh, rights of immigrants. Uh, as to what happens outside the uh, Schengen area, the European Union, uh, there have been missions to, uh, you know, attempts to send advocates to Morocco, uh, well, actually to Greece and Malta, to uh, countries that are members of the European Union, but even outside, to Morocco and to Ukraine, in, well, before the uh, crisis started in Ukraine, in order to try to work with local organizations, develop their work, and try to create some kind of monitoring over what's happening in those countries. Over, for example, police, uh, police abuse and police violence in Morocco, because there, there have been a lot of reports on the way immigrants are being uh, you know, mistreated, so that they have been abandoned in, in the middle of the desert by Moroccan policemen, uh, and so on. So there have been a few, uh, yes, surveys and attempts to create cooperation. So this, yeah, this is going on, and this is probably going to uh, develop following this crisis we are going through right now. Uh, as to the reception of those detention centers, this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, on, the, on the advocacy side, each time a detention center is being built, uh, you have demonstrations, you have, uh, you have some kind of protests, you have protests and demonstrations on the construction sites, for example. Uh, some anarchist uh, activists have even tried to uh, destroy some of the construction, some construction sites before the, uh, the centers were, uh, were finished. So there's, there's a lot happening about this. Uh, as to the reaction of the people who live, who live nearby, most of those detention centers are located nearby international airports or in pretty removed areas. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the centers were actually located in make-do facilities, police facilities that had been found to be, uh, to be available. Uh, one of them, in the early years of immigration detention, was even located next to a the former internment camp of the 1930s that had been used as a concentration, as a concentration camp by the Vichy government during the war. And, and this started a whole uh, uproar of protests from all human rights organizations because basically the police was using you know, what was available. There was a kind of great, let's put the center here. So you, you did have uh, very remote locations. And it's difficult to assess. Uh, I think that until a few years ago, most people who lived nearby a center simply did not know that the center was there. A few years ago, I remember watching a, uh, a small film on YouTube that had been made by uh, activists, uh, yeah, human rights activists, uh, in the small village that is next to the immigration detention center where I worked, where I did my field work. So they basically went into a bar and they asked, they went into a cafe and they asked people about that center over there, did they know what it was? And those people just didn't, didn't know what it was and had never wondered what it was. And so they were told that this was a place where immigrants were locked up. They said, so it's a prison. No, it's not a prison, it's different. Ah, so what is it? And you, know, and you could see that some people became aware that something wasn't right about that, uh, that place. Now, nowadays it might be a bit different because uh, there's been a lot of public uh, emotion over immigration, well, over immigration in general, but uh, over immigration detention in the past years. One of those centers was burned down by uh, the immigrants near Vincennes in the suburbs of Paris in 2008. And as a result, the general public has learned a lot about what immigration detention is. Uh, I've not heard of any kind of action from people, uh, whether people who, were, who would have been uh, against the very existence of the detention center, or people who just didn't want immigrants nearby. This happened in the 1980s, maybe, when the first centers were built. You know, people would protest and say, uh, we don't want that kind of 
uh, the kind of people around here, if they invade, what's going to happen? We're going to have immigrants all over the place and so on. I've not really heard about this uh, in, uh, in the recent years. But it's pretty interesting to see how, even physically, these places are not easy to spot. You have trees, you have ways to camouflage a little bit those centers, even if they have you know, barbed wires and towers and stuff like that. And finally, on the uh, general policy of immigrants, uh, if you talk about militarization, I would say that this is pretty obvious in the case of what's happening outside the, Euro the European Union. Uh, outside in the, uh, in the regions around the uh, Schengen area, if you take, yeah, okay. the map, uh, you have a, a European police agency that's called Frontex, Frontex that's made up of uh, police officers from different member states of the European Union, and that is designed to operate outside the European Union. So they have patrols, border patrols, all around the Schengen area, in the, uh, especially in the Mediterranean, and they also have officers in Morocco, in Libya, uh, in Turkey as well, who are working offshore, as they say, uh, in order to control immigrants. And what I've read on this, uh, there's not been much research actually on Frontex, it would be interesting to, uh, to do research on this, uh, but what I've read about them is that they do use a lot of military uh, apparatus, military device. Uh, boats, infrared detectors, uh, not necessarily weapons, but very sophisticated technical devices in order to detect uh, mainly boats and groups of immigrants trying to enter the uh, European Union. Uh, inside the European Union, uh, there is this logic, uh, this general logic that's also working for criminal, uh, criminal populations or poor populations to try to put all these people further and further from the centers, uh, from the downtown cities and the centers of the cities. There's always been some kind of spatial control of uh, what, uh, what policemen traditionally call the floating populations, the unstable populations. So these people were uh, mainly backgrounds, prostitutes, colonial in Daijins, uh, when France had a colonial empire, and starting in the 20th century, immigrants, foreigners in France, who started being part of that same population. So people who usually cannot be penally prosecuted, they are not criminals, but they are not wanted on the public space. They should not be on the streets. And if they are, they will be taken in custody, um, you know, detained for some hours in a police station, and then they will, they will be released on the, at the other side of the city. This has always happened, but this is happening more and more with the logic of, yes, regrouping the poorer populations and the immigrants in certain neighborhoods outside, uh, outside cities, which is, of course, also a way to uh, better control them. And actually, one of the effects of the uh, deportation process is to give the police and the administration in general uh, a very interesting tool in order to control that population. Because if you look back at those figures I showed, a lot of immigrants who are deportable are never actually deported from the uh, territory, but part of them will be regularly arrested, put in police custody, put in immigration detention centers, then released uh, after the detention time because they could not be deported. So there is a way to differentially manage this illegal presence that's basically bound to remain illegal because it's pretty difficult to be legalized in France right now if you are undocumented. But that's basically never going to leave the territory. So you have uh, bigger and bigger groups, numbers of, uh, of immigrants who are remaining on the territory this way. Mais perguntas? Alguma 
pergunta mais, a gente encerra. Ok, então vamos encerrar. Quero agradecer muito ao Nicolas Fischer pela exposição esclarecedora sobre a situação de detenção dos imigrantes na França e da imigração em geral, do controle da imigração em geral na Europa. E com isso a gente finaliza a palestra. É, agradeço a presença. Obrigada de novo, Nicolás.